All right. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining. This is our 12th, uh, 20th Core Devs call, April 20, 2023. As always, just, uh, just some context. Um, these Core Devs, they are always recorded. They are for core contributors to present what they've been working on, uh, updating the community on what's coming and discuss upcoming features, and also like protocol changes with community members like you. Um, and I'll paste in the uh, the the chat and the in the show notes a link to our ecosystem calendar where you can um, subscribe to all of these upcoming calls and do take the time or this call to ask questions, participate. We do want to hear from you. Today we're going to be talking about uh, a good amount of important GIPs and protocol changes. And also, um, I'm going to be sharing all of the links to the forum where these discussions are, where we're having all of these discussions. So if you want to follow up async, do use the forum to continue asking questions. And we're always on yeah, Discord too. You can, you can reach out and, and, and talk to us. Uh, I just noticed this is not full screen. Yeah. So today's agenda, um, we have a good amount of um, GIPs to cover. We have three major GIPs. The first one is related to the move to Arbitrum 1. We'll be reviewing the plan for increasing indexing re, uh, re, rewards and the related time, timelines. Pablo will also talk about the uh, dependencies here, like the mi migration helpers. And then Ford will go through the current plan to ensure that, no down, that there's no downtime when um, mi mi migrating subgraphs over the L2. And this move to L2 is a big lift and it will require some actions from all stakeholders, including not just indexers, but dele dele uh, delegators, curators, and subgraph owners too. So do take note, ask questions, like I said, and get in touch through the forum if you need some clarity or want to provide any sort of feed feed feedback on this. It's fairly important that you do participate. Next and also extremely important is the GIP 51. <clears throat> That one is a proposed new um, exponential rebate mechanism that is to replace the current Cobb Douglas inspired one used in the protocol to distribute query fee rebates to indexers. Um, as before, these two require some close coordination with different stakeholders, particularly indexers. So uh, do take note, and uh, we'll be hearing from Howard, one of the GIP authors which will go through uh, the details of this new uh, proposal, its implications for indexers, and then I believe Tomaj will also focus on the, uh, the actual implementation details and the execution planning. Um, next is substreams. The, the streaming fast folks, they've been super busy working on the uh, CLI. Now there's a new and pretty nice GUI uh, as well. So we'll take some time to hear from Alex from Streaming Fast on the latest developments here and see what it looks like. There's gonna be a quick demo. Uh, so I'm curious to know what you think, you folks think uh, about this. I've shared this in Discord. I hope we have some subgraph and substreams uh, developers here too, joining this call. And lastly, on substreams, Adam will be going substreams powered sub, sub, subgraphs. We've been talking about this for, for a while. Um, last month, during the last Core Devs call, you heard from Masari um, about the 8x indexing speed um, improvement they've managed to achieve when porting existing ones into this new stack. And we've been working hard on bringing this to the network too, and uh, this should come in the upcoming weeks. And today we'll take some time to hear from Adam what these are, what it looks like, and also, uh, more importantly, the, the 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 actual rollout plan. So, yeah, that's it for today. Let's get started. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. First one is Pablo. Um, yeah, thank you, Nick, for sharing all of these, and I'll also be sharing the the actual forum posts. Pablo, I believe you are already a co-host, so you should be hey. able to share the screen. Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, cool. I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see this? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Um, all right, so yeah, as Pedro said, I'm going to be presenting some updates on the L2 
uh, scaling process, L2 scaling, L2 migration. We've been calling it in several different ways, but the idea is moving the graph network to Arbitrum and uh, having participants do all of their operations, so all of their on-chain operations on Arbitrum instead of uh, Ethereum mainnet. So as we presented about this on, on previous core dev calls, and I will really invite everybody to uh, go check the recordings from those for, for more detailed uh, information about the previous stages that, that we had. Um, we, we've been doing this in several stages. So we had a long preparation phase where we uh, looked at how to uh, build this and how to make this happen. And then there was a, a first stage that was deploying the bridge and deploying the L2 contract. And that happened, I mean, the bridge was deployed December last year, and then throughout Q1 of this year, uh, there's been work on uh, getting Explorer and Studio uh, and uh, other, let's say, off-chain components to support the L2 network. Um, now that that is complete and that we've also um, prepared the contracts for stage two, we are we're currently on stage two, and that is we've enabled indexing rewards on Arbitrum. Um, currently, that's only 5% of the token issuance that is happening on Arbitrum, uh, and then 95% of it is still happening in Ethereum main. Um, so for this to happen, we had to change the way issuance works. Um, so now index and rewards follow a linear formula instead of the exponential that they used to follow. Um, but now we're, we're moving on towards stage three, that is, we want to enable people to very easily migrate uh, from mainnet to Arbitrum so that it, it's, it's very easy for all participants to uh, start um, making use of the benefits of, of the L2 and, and the lowered gas costs. So this is happening very, very soon. Um, and I'm going to give an update on where we are on, on all of this process. Um, so as I mentioned, we've deployed the 5% uh, issuance on L2 um, to mainnet and Arbitrum 1. I mean, also to mainnet because it's changed the way rewards happen on mainnet 2. Um, and it's also reduced issuance on mainnet to 95% of what it used to be. Um, and after this happened, uh, we've had uh, a good amount of people already migrating, uh, well, not migrating, but deploying new subgraphs on L2. So we currently have 120 subgraphs that have been deployed to the L2 network, um, which is pretty good uh, considering we've uh, just started and there's only this like, smaller incentive. Um, and because of the smaller incentive, we also had a fair amount of stake um, from indexers that has moved to L2 um, and some delegators that have started delegating on L2 as well. So in total, that's about 20 million GRT, um, which is, um, still small considering that uh, this is less than 5% of the stake that we have on our one. So uh, it's still growing slowly, uh, but it's still nice to see that uh, some participants are starting to um, set up their operations. Uh, indexers are starting to set up their operations and serving subgraphs there, um, which is pretty cool to see. Um, at the same time, we've been working on the migration helpers and we're almost done with the audits. All of the GNS, so the subgraph and curation migration helpers have been audited already. And the um, migration helpers for stake uh, delegation and for vesting contracts are almost, almost done. We had the initial report from the auditors. We uh, prepared the fixes for that and we're just waiting for the final report now. Um, so we still need to do some testing of all of these contracts. Uh, we're developing a formal test plan and we're, we're gonna be running that like we did for the previous stages. Um, but we're getting very close. So hopefully in the next few weeks, uh, we'll have the contract site ready for that. And at the same time, all of the UI development for the migration helpers is happening. So there's going to be changes in Explorer and Studio so that um, the different participants have a, a, a simple interface to be able to migrate their stake, their delegation. So I think my microphone died. Can you still hear me? Yeah, Paul, we can still hear you. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so um, as I said, UI development for that is ongoing. It's quite a challenge because it's, it's not a very uh, easy flow to expose in a way that is easy to use. Um, and then finally, 
Um, we recently published GAP 52, and this proposal is increasing the L2 rewards in four steps until we get to 100% on L2. At the end of this process, we will have all of the token issuance, all of the indexing rewards happening in Arbitrum. And uh, we would consider at that point that the migration is complete in that um, there's going to be very little, if any, uh, activity on L1 after that. Um, so uh, brief recap on migration helpers. Uh, again, go to previous core dev calls um, if you want more detail or uh, check out GAP 46. Um, we're providing contracts and, and a related uh, user interface to migrate subgraphs, creation, indexer stake, delegation, and vesting contracts. And this is very important because a lot of indexers and delegators are using vesting contracts to, to stake or delegate. Um, and the basic idea is there is going to be a function on the L1 GNS or the L1 staking contract that you can call and that will send the state uh, that is uh, related to that uh, participant to uh, the counterpart on L2. Yeah, so generally, it's going to be one or two transactions that uh, each participant needs to do in order to move to L2. And in the case of uh, subgraphs and curation, the subgraph owners will uh, migrate the subgraphs, and then curators can choose uh, whether they want to migrate their curation or uh, and when they want to do it. And the same for indexing uh, indexer stake and delegation. In, uh, indexers choose when to migrate their stake, and they can do it partially. Um, and then delegators choose uh, when to migrate their delegation to L2 or if they prefer to withdraw it in L1. Uh, and then for vesting contracts, it's a bit trickier, uh, but um, the vesting beneficiaries will be able to set up an L2 counterpart of their vesting contract and then uh, use that as their L2 identity to send their stake and delegation to be owned by these uh, L2 vesting contracts. Um, so that's a, a, a general idea. And then uh, for the uh, uh, in, in a few minutes, we'll describe some uh, improvements to the indexer stack uh, to handle what happens when a sub, uh, subgraph migrates um, to L2. Uh, the improvements for that are happening on both the gateway and the indexer uh, stack, so indexer agent. Um, so yeah, we'll focus a bit more on that. Um, so increasing rewards in L2. Um, as I said, it's it's going from 5% to 100% in several milestones over a few months. Uh, we are setting migration helpers as a prerequisite for any increases. So it's currently at 5% and the first bump will not happen um, before migration helpers for, for all of the participants are released. Um, we're going to be monitoring that things go well in each step and reset the timeline if anything goes wrong with the contracts in particular. But if other things go wrong, uh, of course, we'll be fixing and, and adjusting the timeline as needed. And there's going to be an ongoing conversation about the requirements um, for each of the steps. Uh, we've already had lots of great feedback on the forum and at the indexer office hours uh, call, and we're going to be incorporating uh, that into the proposal. Um, and we're going to keep chatting about that and, and try to keep discussing um, before doing any of these steps, um, at least go through an indexer office hours to make sure that there's nothing uh, weird that's, for instance, stopping indexers from, from migrating or, or causing any other issues. Um, so uh, the four steps, uh, first one will go from 5 to 25%. Uh, we're trying to aim for, let's say, one or two weeks after migration hoppers have released, have been released. Um, and we will have to validate that all the participants can use the helpers before uh, actually doing the bump. Um, and then not too, uh, too much later after that, so let's say about two weeks later, we would bump to 50%. Um, after validating that already some subgraphs have actually migrated and some indexers have actually migrated. So we have a, a more uh, lively network on L2. Um, and at that point, there's going to be a sort of parity between L1 and L2. Uh, and we're thinking we should keep that going for about two months um, just to, to have a more uh, solid validation that everything's working well. Um, and because be before the next jump, that would be for 95%, uh, uh, we would hope that, I, I mean, we would require that a lot of indexers have migrated and the QoS 102 is similar to the 101. And, and based on feedback from indexers, um, we would probably add some requirement for delegators from, uh, you know, some amount of delegators to also have uh, migrated 202 um, so that, uh, yeah, we don't leave this participant behind. Uh, and if there are delegators that are a bit, uh, are a bit slower to, to migrate, uh, we still have a, a healthy amount of delegation moving to L2 before we do this big uh, final bump. Uh, so to 95%, that would 
uh, kind of invert the current state that we have. Um, and then we would still keep that 5% on a one, mostly because uh, some subgraph developers might uh, take a bit longer to migrate it. And we don't want to um, put them in a position where all of the rewards go to L2 very quickly. And then um, there's no more indexers there. And then there's no, uh, uh, you can't query those subgraphs anymore. Uh, so we want to avoid that. Uh, that's pretty important. So we're saying then the 95 to 100 percent uh, bump would happen at least one month later, but we would first have to validate that most subgraphs uh, that have actual queries have migrated. Um, so the first proposal was saying uh, 90 percent of subgraphs have migrated. I think we're going to change that a little bit, maybe to say that uh, 90 or 95 percent or something like that of query fees uh, have actually migrated to two. Um, so uh, I think that's all I had. Yeah. So uh, now. Uh, Ford uh, will present a bit more about the, the specifics of how we um, are supporting subgraph migration through the indexer stack. Hey, everyone. Um, so in order to support, uh, if you could go back to, yeah. Um, in order to support the uh, subgraph migrations from L1 to L2, uh, we're planning and, and starting to implement some changes to the indexer stack. Um, and the main changes are going to be to the indexer agent. Uh, and basically what we'll be doing is adding support for the indexer agent to operate across both networks, L1 and L2. Um, and this is going to be required in order to support no downtime migrations for the subgraphs. Um, and so the indexer agent will be able to be aware of subgraphs both on L1 and L L2. Uh, we'll be able to see when that migration starts and start allocating automatically to the L2, the new L2 version of the subgraph. Um, in order to support this, uh, the indexer agent will need to be aware of both networks um, and will support a combined strategy of allocating stake across both the L1 and L2. Um, on the next slide, I have some details around those changes. Let's go there. Next. Uh, cool. So yeah, in L1 and L2 mode, which will be coming up in the indexer agent, uh, the indexer agent will connect to an RPC provider and a network subgraph from each of the protocol networks, uh, whereas right now it only supports connecting to one. Um, and this will allow the indexer agent to read data from the network uh, as well as write uh, send transactions to the network. Um, it will support a single shared backend uh, with shared graph nodes and Postgres database. Uh, this is really important. So the indexer doesn't have to resync subgraphs on L2 um, and can have a, a single shared database with all the data. So there's no redundancy required. Um, this is important for the no downtime subgraph migration, uh, but this is also going to be a really big benefit for especially large indexers as they move to L2. So they don't have to resync all the significant amount of data that they have uh, often in the range of terabytes. Um, we're going to be making changes to pretty much all the data models to include a, a protocol network identifier. Um, and so your indexing rules will now be able to be defined specific to the network. Um, indexers will be able to set different default indexing rules per network. Uh, for example, setting different default allocation amounts uh, because there's kind of different environments of indexing rewards on L1 and L2, and those will be changing. Um, and then all items in the action queue will be labeled with the protocol network. Uh, Prometheus metrics will add protocol network labels um, and all indexer CLI commands will be updated so you can filter results by network. Uh, so in summary, the agent will basically be aware of both networks um, and the actions across both. So you'll be able to manage your strategy um, in one place across L1 and L2 and, and gradually manage your migration as you move stake from L1 to L2. Um, I think that's all we have on the L2 migration. Um, I think maybe now's a good time to ask any questions in the chat if you have them. I'm going to post in the chat. I have a, there was a GitHub issue where we were discussing these index agent updates. Um, so you guys can follow along there. Or we have time to answer some of these questions or? Yeah, yeah, we can have one, two minutes and then we can 
we have to move on. Yeah, but we can answer Simon's and Mark's questions. Cool. So um, do subgraph devs need to become active to migrate to L2? Um, not sure what you mean by becoming active, but but yes, the, so the migration will not be automatic. Subgraph devs that uh, want to migrate to L2 would have to execute the transaction themselves um, through the Explorer or I think Studio UI to do this. Um, and then would it support different indexer addresses for L2? Yes, for all of the migration helpers, uh, because the participant on L1 might be using a multisig or a smart contract that doesn't exist on L2, um, all of the time. Uh, so um, every single time that uh, you want to do a migrate, a migration, you have to specify an L2 beneficiary that's going to be your L2 address. Obviously, you can't choose one for part of your stake and, and a different one for another part of your stake. It's always the same identity. Uh, but it's uh, always you you have a choice to specify who you what your L2 address is. Um, in the vesting contracts case, this is going to be like auto assigned to the L2 vesting contract for an unvested, uh, a not fully vested contract. Uh, but for everything else, that L2 address is something that you can set. Um, what happens if they don't migrate? Well, um, if if enough people don't have, uh, don't migrate. Um, when we get to that 95% stage, we won't move forward if um, th there's a, a significant amount of people that don't want to migrate. Um, and then if that happens, we'll have to revisit and, and um, as a community decide what, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna keep supporting L1 indefinitely uh, or are we gonna do something else? So uh, I think right now there's consensus that we wanna move to L2, the whole network. Um, but if uh, we get to that 95% stage and, and there's like a significant percentage of people who don't want to move to L2, then, then the community will have to revisit and, and the council will have to um, decide how to move forward. Uh, maybe with a community vote, uh, I don't know. We'll have to cross that bridge when we get there. Um, do subgraphs need to be re-indexed from scratch when they migrate to L2? Um, I think that's a question that Ford can answer. I think not. Uh, yeah, the idea with this is that uh, it's going to be a choice for indexers, but hopefully we have many indexers that will operate on L1 and L2 in this combined mode. And if you have the subgraph synced already from L1, um, your indexer agent will simply need to allocate it to it on the L2 and you'll already have it synced and you won't need to, to do any work to resync or re-index the data. Um, and that's important for the, the quick migration over with no downtime. Awesome. And then I see I, I, you put in the chat that, yeah, uh, Mark Andre was asking specifically about the indexer agent with the L2 address. Um, and you responded that we can support that. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah. Thanks, folks, for the questions. Thank you, Pablo and Ford. Yeah, we can continue in the chat answering some questions, but we do have to move on with the agenda. So thanks again, Pablo, Ford. Um, Howard, are you ready? You should be. Yeah. Okay, there you go. So Tomas will share his yeah. screen. I'm sharing just a sec. There we go. Let me know if it's coming Is it up. A, it full screen? It's not full screen. Come again? It's not full screen, oh. but we can just, yeah. Okay, no, no, yeah, that's good. Good awesome. Yep. I'll go ahead and hop awesome. in. So uh, this is a brief update on some progress we've made regarding regarding query fee rebates. So Tomas, can you jump to the slide? So here's a reference on a couple of documents that we think would be helpful to read. Um, namely, there's GIP 51 that's linked in the forum. There's been some discussion there. So that's would be the primary place to follow up after um, regarding this update. And there is um, some of the code posted, not yet audited. And slide. So what we want to do is we want to propose changing how rebates work uh, in the graph. This is largely oriented towards the indexer audience uh, for their revenue streams. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so this is really oversimplified, but essentially for anyone you know in the community that's not quite familiar with this concept, essentially what happens is users pay for queries in some fashion, those payments go into a smart contract, indexers interact with that and get some portion of that as their payment for serving a query. 
the part that the indexers get is called their rebate. So that is what, whenever we say indexer rebates, you can think the amount of money the indexer is getting from the query fees. And so in all of these slides, that's what I'll be referring to. Okay, and slide. So uh, just, you know, glossing over this a bit, but essentially the importance here is we're interested in this because we want there to be a lot of query fees in the network. And when that happens, uh, we expect that the rebates will be a substantial part of indexer revenue. And so we want to make sure this is as efficient and, you know, uh, useful for everyone as possible. And so that's just that second point there. So there's indexing rewards today, but then, yeah, the rebates were um, the big emphasis for this. Okay, go ahead. All right, so now this is where I'll slow down a bit. Why do we want to change rebates? What's going on here? Well, today, when you look at how the rebates operate, if I'm going to try to summarize this at a high level, what you have to do is you look and say, how much stake do I have in GRT? And how much stake do a lot of other indexers have in GRT? And how many query fees are they serving? And how many query fees am I serving? And then if you get all those things together in the right way, you can actually compute what the rebates you'll get are. Unfortunately, you can't know what everyone else's decisions are going to be. And so you have uncertainty in the amount of GRT you're going to actually get for serving any particular query. And so you have this uncertainty. It's kind of complicated as far as how you have to reason about it with all these different you know, uh, interactions between people. And an additional consequence of how it operates today is that there's a lot of the rebate that is burnt. And when I say burnt, I mean, as an example, if a consumer pays one GRT for a query fee, maybe only 0.6 GRT end up to the actual indexer that served the query. Maybe it's 0.65, but the point is there's actually a substantial percentage of query fees today that are just burnt and they you know, essentially cease to exist so the indexers are not getting that. And that creates a point of friction where either the consumers could be paying slightly less or the index is making more or some combination of the two. Either way, this is causing a hindrance to the ability of indexers to make you know, a profit from serving queries. And so we can think of the Cobb Douglas inspired form of rebates. Right now it's, it's kind of complicated. It's kind of opaque to a lot of indexers, you know, as far as like trying to explain how the different pieces work and trying to predict things. And also importantly, it's inefficient. And what we'd like to do is switch to something that's simple so that, you know, we can explain it clearly. People can get the concept. It's intuitive. They maybe, for example, don't have a lot of uncertainty and then it's efficient, meaning that there's not a lot of query fees being thrown away. It's really just going directly from the consumers to the indexers as much as possible. There are additional concerns or, you know, things that we need to do to ensure the security of the protocol, but we want to make it as streamlined as possible for everyone. And so that's the, the real emphasis of what we're trying to do with this change. And slide. So this is the, the one mathy type slide. And essentially there's two, let's say magic numbers or protocol parameters. And if I am looking at a particular subgraph as an indexer, and I need to figure out how much am I going to get rebated for serving queries on that subgraph, the formula is like what we see here on the top right. So R sub IJ, that stands for the rebate the ith indexer gets for serving on the jth subgraph. And the Q sub IJ is the query fees for the ith indexer on the jth subgraph. And the S sub IJ is the stake that they have that by the ith indexer for the jth subgraph. And so this little expression that you see on the top right, also shown on the bottom left, it's this one minus alpha e to some uh, exponent. Essentially what it's saying is that if you stake a lot relative to your queries that are being served, you'll get essentially all of the queries. This number in parentheses will essentially be one when you have a lot of stake relative to the amount of queries that are being served. And so, you know, if query fees are sufficiently, sufficiently large, this is essentially going to encourage indexers to stake in proportion to the query fees. Now that's ignoring indexing rewards for the moment, but just think about this as we're, you know, moving forward with the evolution of, you know, the graph. And so right now, 
this formula that you, you see only has the particular indexers, query fees, and stake involved. So this indexer now can say, well, how much am I staking? How many query fees am I serving? Okay, this is exactly, I can compute with this you know, one-line formula, how much I should expect to get rebated. There's not uncertainty about what anyone else is doing, and I don't have to depend on other people's staking decisions. And so that's kind of the, the big summary here is that, you, you know, this is the one line formula. You just take as inputs, your query fees and the stake. Now, what we'll talk about is the stake ratio. In this uh, fourth bullet point, you see S sub IJ over Q sub IJ. That's the amount that you are staking relative to the amount of query fees uh, you're serving. Essentially, everyone in the graph today, as far as indexers go, have a very large stake ratio as, as far as this formula is concerned. Okay, let's go to the next slide and try to make this a little more concrete. Yeah, so here's what that curve looks like. That formula, if you as you increase the stake ratio, what's going on is that you're getting a larger and larger proportion of your query fees. So if you have a stake ratio of, let's say, 10, you're essentially going to get almost 100%. It's like 99 point something. It'll be more clear on the next uh, slide. But the goal here is to encourage people, you know, to stake for, for, you know, we need it for collateral and such for security. And so this is what it's going to look like intuitively for you guys. And slide. Okay, so let me now walk through one little numerical example. Let's suppose that as an indexer, I serve 100 GRTs worth of query fees, as in, you know, someone paid that much. And it was on, let's say, some random subgraph, and I had allocated a thousand GRT. In that case, if you go through and plug in the numbers with these tentative parameters that we're suggesting in the GIP, um, where alpha is one and lambda is 0.6, if you just go down on the left side, you see this R sub IJ. We just take each of those variables and plug in our numbers, the 100 and the thousand, and then the lambda and alpha values. And we get out 99.75. So this means that if someone had served 100 GRTs worth of queries, they're going to get back all of that but 0.25, which is a substantial improvement from today where there could be you know 30% or more that's being uh, burnt. And so that's uh, hopefully going to make it much more efficient for everybody. Okay, and slide. So last slide as far as economic concerns. Tomas is going to take us over uh, more implementation things. But today you have to uh, get rebated based on the network state. And so this requires, you know, using these pools and interacting and thinking about how everyone else is behaving, which makes it just really hard to think about and how hard to optimize, you know, your decisions on how much, you know, to be staking on these things. Uh, in addition, you don't know necessarily how much you're going to be rebated and it's inefficient. You can pretty much flip all of these now with our new proposal. And so hopefully that should be much simpler for everyone. And with that, I'm going to hand it over. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Howard. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, what this means uh, like in terms of uh, actions required for indexers and how this impacts uh, operations. Um, so far, Howard has covered like uh, the economic side and how like we are changing the formula. So initially or intuitively you could think that the implementation for this is like a drop-in replacement you take the old formula take it out put the new formula in and that's it um that's not quite uh it in reality uh but that's a good thing because um the main thing is okay we are changing the formula yes but the most important thing here is that we are removing uh this dependency that the current formula has on the network state, on like other indexers stake, other indexers decisions, etc. Uh, so that uh, removing that allows us to make uh, several like protocol simplifications, protocol changes. Uh, that for one, uh, they remove uh, a lot of code, so the code footprint goes down, which is always some something that uh, makes us very happy. Um, and the other thing is that it reduces the complexity, both in terms of like the protocol complexity and also in terms of like the indexer operations. Um, here on the on this slide, you can see on the left side, it's the current uh, Cobb Douglas rebates mechanism. Um, 
as you can see, it's a, um, a two-step uh, process. Um, initially, once an allocation is closed, uh, the indexer software will uh, like redeem a voucher uh, through the allocation exchange. The allocation exchange will like send uh, the tokens that are uh, uh, related to the voucher into the staking contracts. Um, those will be accumulated in what we call uh, rebate pools. Um, and rebate pools is this concept that we uh, have in the implementation, uh, which is really uh, like a bucket where we accumulate query fees for a certain period of time, for it's like a, a window of time. And then we apply the Cap Douglas formula to, to that bucket, if you will. Um, and that's um, one, something that we need to do because we depend on, on the network state again. So we cannot uh, do this two-step process in a single one because we need to account for some window of time where we are applying this, this formula, right? Um, so the second step after uh, certain amount of time has passed, which is defined by uh, this network uh, the protocol parameter, uh, the indexer can then uh, submit a second transaction and claim uh, whatever rebates they are um, owed, uh, right? So now let's look at the proposed um, implementation for the exponential rebates. Um, the first thing you'll notice, it's a single step um, operation. So the indexer will just uh, redeem their voucher and instantly, uh, automatically, you will get uh, the, the rebates calculated and the rebates will be, get transferred back to the indexer. That's single transaction, uh, no window of time, no rebate pools. Um, all that uh, complexity gets uh, thrown away, which is uh, great, I think. Um, there we go. Uh, so yeah, just to summarize, uh, the first thing is uh, rebate pools are removed. It's, this allows us to do instant rebates. You just uh, uh, redeem your voucher and you get uh, the rebates back. Um, that's a single transaction, uh, which is good. It's versus the previous uh, case. And the second change or uh, simplification is that we no longer need this window of time uh, defined by this parameter. We no longer need uh, several uh, allocation states um, that were part of the life cycle of an allocation. Um, claimed and finalized, those don't really mean anything um, with the new implementation. Um, there is an, another uh, uh, consequence derived of this that query fees will no longer get burnt uh, after, like if you are late to uh, collect your fees. So today, if you uh, redeem a voucher and like, um, more than one week or, or has passed after the allocation has been closed, like those fees are, are burnt because you like you missed your window of opportunity to uh, get in uh, the rates. Uh, that's not going to happen anymore, which is also uh, good. So um, breaking changes, this is uh, maybe not really a breaking change, but it's uh, one very important thing to take into consideration. Um, Again, uh, the current behavior is a two-step uh, approach, two transactions, where you first redeem your voucher, you then claim your rebates. The new behavior is uh, just a single transaction when you do both uh, on the same uh, operation. Um, initially, we don't, this doesn't mean that you need uh, to update the indexer software to be compatible with the new upgrade. Um, this is because we kept the same interface for the first transaction. Uh, so there are no immediate uh, updates required in order to, to get ready for, for this um, implementation. Uh, but uh, the second transaction, like after the upgrade, uh, will of course be reverting if you um, send that transaction to the contracts. Uh, so in a later upgrade um, for the indexer stack, we will need to remove that uh, but it's not a, a hard prerequisite um, to get ready for, for this uh, implementation. Okay, the second um, thing I wanted to talk about in terms of uh, 
big important changes is uh, the removal of the risk taking flag. Um, the so the current the way this currently works is that when you claim your rebates on the second transaction, there's a flag you can pass you can uh, configure. If that flag is set to true, the rebates are automatically restaked. If that flag is set to false, the rebates are transferred back to the indexer uh, address or the indexer address defined by their uh, rewards distribution address. Um, this um, this is this change is really not a consequence of uh, of of this JP, but it's uh, something we wanted to do to get in line with how uh, indexing rewards work. So the way indexing rewards work and the way we propose the, the new uh, query fees rebates work is that uh, there is no more flag. And then the behavior, it depends on whether or not you have a rewards destination address set. If the indexer has an, uh, an address set for that, the rebates get transferred automatically. If they don't, their each rebates get restaked automatically. Um, this making this change is good first. So both indexing rewards and query fee rebates are uh, operate similarly, but also it allows us to not make changes to the allocation exchange, which is the other contract that's involved in this. Uh, like we could uh, remove this uh, this change from the GIP. Uh, but we would need to upgrade that other contract to account for that. So that's uh, the reason behind this change. Um, in the interest of time, um, I won't be able to cover today um, what the upgrade path, what the actions required from indexers are, and what's the timeline for this. There will be a, a follow-up session uh, where we will be talking about this uh, during an IOH. Um, that's coming up on May 9th. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, stay, uh, yeah, be sure you, you attend that. Um, I can anticipate uh, one thing, which I also saw someone asking in, in chat that uh, this update will take place. I don't have a date, but I can say it will take place after the L2 migrators are available. So um, at least a month or two away yeah uh too much thank you so much can we try to answer questions in the chat yeah in one? yeah, yeah. Perfect. let me see okay nice uh will this be implemented on both uh, l1 and l2 yes this will be implemented uh rolled out simultaneously to both uh, networks uh when will this update take place okay i think i already said that can we yeah, introduce uh, logic? We can, we can respond in the chat, otherwise we will not be able to move on. Oh, OK. OK, sorry, I didn't okay. think it. OK. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll include these in the show notes so for those that will be watching this on, on, on YouTube anyway. Um, cool. Again, thank you, Howard and Tomas, for your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I believe we have Alex as well, also as co-host. Alex, you should be ready to share yeah, your screen. I am. There you go. Okay. Hey. Hello, everybody. I want to do a quick demo. We're going to come back to uh, from the uh, if the real realities of math to something a little bit more concrete there with a GUI application that we're rolling out for substreams. You might have seen it already. We had a first version, and I want to show you just a bunch of new features for those who are developing substreams. You were using substreams run. Uh, you'll be able to use substreams GUI now. We're about to do a release. And I'm going to show off a few of the features in there. OK, so this is the GUI. It has a few tabs, and it's uh, terminal-based, like in the old days. And you can navigate a little bit of the, uh, the documentation of the substreams module you're looking for. In here, you'll have all the progress. If there's massive parallel operations happening, you'll see all these bars coming through. And then you can navigate the results. And I'm going to show you a few shortcuts that can, you can use to navigate and understand what sort of data is coming through. And also realize that the debugging experience in substreams, it's much closer to the metal than with subgraphs. And that's a new opportunity that we're going to we'll discover together. So here we're, we're in the graph out module and multiple modules and substreams. We can switch from module to module with two keys here. And there's a new feature for those who didn't know that you can search the modules with little M. 
And then you can like punch in the few first few letters and hitting like up and down and whatnot. And then you're going to switch to that module. Okay, so the module switcher now gets improved. It was horrible up there. It's better. And then you see all these little dots that those mean that at this particular block, that module outputted some data. And you can jump from one another with O and P like that, jump back and forth. And now there's a new search feature, something we've added. Let's say we're interested in that thing here. We can search with slash, which is very similar to less. It's a you know, local implementation that searches on the current page, yes. See, there's four instances here. So with little n, you can jump down and up. Capital N, lower N goes up and down. But also, it applies the search to all blocks. So you can find quickly what other blocks match. See, in this case, there's no other match. Let's search for anything with the string pool address slash pool address. What like happens is that there's a lot of matches. They're red. Maybe you don't see that easily, but this is red now. And you can use you know, skips to go to those with capital O, capital P, goes to the next block where there is a match. See, this one has partial match. This doesn't match. This does not match, but this one goes. So we're going to jump directly to the next matching block. So that's already to something. We've also rolled out a, I'm going to go to the uh, graph out module, which outputs things like entities that go directly into graph node for building substreams based subgraph. And in here, we also have a search feature that is slash slash. And now you get in JQ mode. For those who don't know JQ, it's a JSON query language. You have not normally like on a, you know, on the command line, you can query whatever you pipe in JSON and this will format it for you, right? And so that's JQ, but we have that baked in. So you can say entity changes and then hit enter and it's gonna shrink down what you have there. And also we've added the search history. So if you go up, up, see, you can go back in the history, switch even the search mode and continue to refine your, you know, what you're looking for, where ID is equal to that thing. And then you're gonna get only that one. So you can dig and that also does all the search match and you can skip to the next block to see only the things that you're interested in. So, and that the, the search is just free form. So that's, that's a few of the things you can now also, uh, let's say, um, uh, go, if there's logs here, there's log capital L will remove the logs so you don't search into them, capital L. Are there other options you can see here? Oh, there's a new formatter for you guys working with bytes. If you use the F key, you, I don't I don't see here, but like if you have bytes or serialized, normally it's base64. Now you just hit F. You don't need to go to the command line, decode base64 to hex. So you just it's gonna cycle through the, the method of decoding for bytes, going through hex based, you know, base64 strings and whatnot. So right up there in your screen. There's a new feature also. If you hit R, it's gonna restart the stream. So you go, you modify your source code, you're satisfied with I don't know what here. You've changed a few things. In your code, rebuild it, and then hit R, and it's going to rerun the whole thing, and you'll get the updated data right in the same context, same block, same module, you get the updated value. Now, and one last thing I want to show is we have now a visualizer for the structure, so the graph structure of the substreams module. So we're in graph out, you see all of these are the inputs to the graph out module. You can go there and discover a little bit more, you know, of uh, what are the um, the childs and all that, right? What are the childs? All the consumers for map extract. So you can sort of visualize it. Eventually that becomes a switcher also for, for better understanding of the data dependency tree, which is a core proposition of uh, substreams. So I think that covers it up and down and all these things. You have now decodable keys. We haven't had on the previous version. So you can see the values for the keys. And also, you know, protobuf decoded, for example, when it's a key that sets a certain protobuf, you have it all decoded. So normally you'd be able to search that. It's much more intuitive. So that's it for the GUI. Last thing, there's another tool that we've crafted, Junior crafted, is a thing to test. You know, the graph out here, module like sending out entities and field changes and creation and whatever, new values that would go into the entity. This little tool we launch and it queries GraphQL, the subs, the subgraph in GraphQL, and it validates that all the values are the same. So it's looking for that particular entity, querying for that ID, for that field name. This is the value that comes out. 
And then you can go systematically all blocks based on the graph out output to query the other one and do comparison. And there's a bunch of finicky things we can do. Like this means it's good, but you can also uh, in, the, in the test there, declare that certain fields you tolerate certain error or you want them to be rounded to the shortest, you know, whatever decimal places, or you're ignoring those because you're safe with that, right? So you can, can just customize and see what is going to be tested. And uh, that's mostly it. So I think it's pretty cool. We're gonna ship that and we're gonna release it soon. You can already build from source and this will aid massively in, you know, the, de the debugging experience, even before it reaches any Postgres database, which usually what, what takes a lot of time, you can go and inspect midways in the, in the, in the chain after a million block with parallel operation uh, happening before. So you can concentrate on debugging, you know, one aspect without loading in Postgres. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you all. See you there. Thanks, Alex. Would you say the substreams channel we have on Discord would be the right place for folks to reach out and comment on all of these and ask questions? There's a lot of things that happen in our Discord, so I'm kind of split, but uh, you can go there. There's a substreams channel in the, the, the Graph Discord. Oh, uh, yes, of course. Uh, so reach out. Any means is going to be good. We're going to try to, to listen there. Cool. All right. Uh, nice segue into Adam's presentation, right? Yes, there was um, um, definitely cut, like complimentary stuff there. So let me um, maybe slideshare. Is that going to work? Can you see the slide? Yeah, your full screen. Perfect. Um, so yes, so so this is very much in the same ballpark. Um, a lot of the same um, stuff that we're working on <clears throat> across the teams at the moment. So um, some time ago, we had a, a, a post on the forum. Uh, so substreams into subgraphs, a uh, simple integration. I think things are always um, maybe simpler in 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 prospect. Um, but I, th I think what's been amazing about this uh, this whole effort is the number of teams who've um, been contributing across the ecosystem. So we've got folks uh, building substreams, building tooling for substreams, um, building uh, infrastructure and syncs for substreams, and so it's really uh, been cool to see it all like all all come together across teams. Uh, with everyone bringing their different talents to bear. So um, uh, I guess, so Alex touched on some things. Um, again, uh, for some people, this this will be uh, uh, understood, but the anatomy of a substream looks kind of like this. You've got protobuf, uh, so the shape of the data. You've got um, you've got modules, which essentially like are processing that data. And then you've got the substreams to .yaml, which kind of pulls, pulls it all together um, and sort of uh, coordinates uh, coordinates what's happening. This has a lot of parallels with subgraphs, obviously. Um, and so then there's this interesting thing of how we feed um, feed a subgraph with uh, with that substream uh, with that substream data. So uh, substreams need syncs; they're stateless. Alex has talked about this before. And a subgraph uh, is a sync. There's a Postgres database there. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the data into it. Um, and so entity changes. Alex Alex talked about these are the are the link. Um, so essentially, uh, it's a special type of of substreams handler which out outputs these entity changes, um, which essentially graph node can then take entity changes. If if there's now if there's a module which um, produces entity changes, graph node can essentially just suck them up um, and put them into um, put the put them into the database as long as the the um, data that's being produced matches a schema.graphql file. So now we're getting into subgraph land. So um, we've got that uh, local developer experience that. Alex pointed to um, or, or run through there. And I think it is definitely true that, um, I don't know if you've got subgraph developers in the audience, but um, that experience of building a subgraph, code gen, build, deploy, um, seeing if it syncs, seeing if it hits um, <clears throat> hits an, an, an error with substreams with the local development environment, you can be running the indexing process, doing that validation um, in your local terminal, testing and, 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 and learning uh, much more quickly. Um, and then essentially when you're ready to go, you can just uh, essentially Make sure everything is going into the graph out as you'd expect, um, and uh, and then you can deploy it to your subgraph. So that's um, <clears throat> if we take a, a, so Masari have been building loads of great substreams um, using their ETH supply as an example. Um, I think my thing is covering this. Um, the entity changes are the end output, which then means the subgraph can consume it. Um, so you put it into subscreen subgraph. You've got your substream package. You've got your GraphQL schema. You've got a very simple subgraph.yaml file. Um, you essentially pack your, pack your substream, um, which you can see is re referenced here. Um, you then graph build. Again, I'm moving this everywhere apart from where it needs to be. Um, 
Yep. Um, and then graph build and graph deploy. Um, and essentially it will then, uh, so here you're using the substream CLI, here you're using, you're using the graph, um, graph CLI, but it's only a few commands to really bring it all together. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the current status of this and conscious of time, uh, substream based data sources are supported in graph node, core developers are dog fooding integration for top use cases and subgraphs. Alex pointed to a couple of the tools that we're using to, um, to think about cross comparing data from a conventional subgraph to a substream powered subgraph to make sure we're getting consistent data. Um, other ecosystem participants are starting to run files and substreams infrastructure, um, and there's a MIPS uh, mission coming up to get people, uh, get indexes running um, substreams, which essentially means running a fire hose, means um, uh, exposing a substream endpoint and then connecting your graph node to it to index a subgraph, um, as, as I've described. Um, and we're generally trying to um, work on better, more uniform, unified documentation for substreams. Um, in general, um, but also substreams in particular as a subgraph data source. Um, so uh, there's also a lot of work which we're learning as we're dog fooding um, this um, ways we can make things work better. So one is um, more efficient writes to the database. One thing we see is that um, uh, we we start to hit up on the limits where you write per block as subgraphs do. Um, and so we're working on more efficient writes to the database. Um, Masari has mentioned are making lots of ready-made APIs. Um, parameterized sub substreams are maybe a really powerful tool to um, reduce the amount of manual building and, and, and duplication, increase the sort of like modularity and uh, benefiting from other people's work that's possible in substreams. And then uh, Alex has talked a lot about turning a lot of their learnings into cookbooks and examples so people are building stuff um, in the right way and, and, and they have the information that they need. Um, in terms of what happens next, um, we sort of are through the proposal and initial implementation phase. We're doing testing documentation, making some of those improvements as mentioned. Uh, coming up is an, I guess, an open alpha um, on the Subgraph Studio um, for developers. MIPS program for indexers to get um, start um, testing this this new functionality uh, onto an open beta and general availability on 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 the network after that. Um, and so uh, we are running out of time. So I don't know if we even have any time um, for questions. Um, but uh, <laughs> yes, um, uh, yes. Well, so so the, the example I was just showing there was in this um, <clears throat> was in the Masari substreams example, Dylan. Um, but I, th I think one thing we definitely want to make available is, is is more examples that show um, all of the different patterns that we're kind of um, that we're seeing. Um, <clears throat> yes, there's, they, they, they've got some great examples there and they've very much been leading the way on some, in particular, some of the network-wide um, substreams. I think we're out of time. Yeah, we are. Perfect. <laughs> Nicely timed, right, uh, Adam. Yeah, I just posted a, an example that Mr. just shared with me very recent, recently, uh, but uh, we can share some more in the disc in our Discord too. So do reach out, deal in our Substreams channel. We'll be taking a look. And yeah, as Adam mentioned, we'll be working on better, better docs and cookbooks and examples. Um, yes, yeah, so at that time, I just wanted to do one final shout out to Darby. Uh, she's a graph advocate. Um, she's she's an advocate. She's been doing great work on collecting all of these notes and sharing it on Twitter. Super helpful get like a nice tweet, tweet, tweet thread. So do be on the lookout for those um, summaries on Twitter moving forward as well. Thanks, Darby. And that's it. Thank you all so much. We're at, we're at time. Um, yeah, again, this will be uploaded to, you, to YouTube for others that can, if you want to go back and uh, check some of the presentations we, we had. So thank you all for joining. I'll see you all in a month. Bye.